Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Science in the Age of COVID-19. Uh, today, we are super privileged to have um, Professor Laura Vela from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the UPenn School of Medicine. Um, Laura's lab has been hugely uh, influential in studying various aspects of human immunology in the past, uh, mostly focusing on HIV, uh, and looking at a uh, response of uh, helper and follicular T cell response. Um, of course, you know, this is an old story by this point um, that uh, when the pandemic arose, um, lots of scientists uh, pivoted their lab. Uh, she focused, um, you know, a lot on COVID and um, deep immune profiling of uh, various sets of patients. And today is going to be super interesting, uh, I mean, and just hugely important uh, as, you know, we, we try to get our kids back to school and we wonder, you know, should we be vaccinating kids, et cetera, um, that, you know, early on in the pandemic, it became apparent that something was happening um, in children with severe covid um, You know, in the early days, we were calling it uh, Kawasaki syndrome until, um, you know, someone who knew better slapped slap me down and said, we're not calling it that. We're actually calling it this other thing now, um, Miss C. And um, Laura is going to tell us um, everything there is to know about this. And I'm super excited. So uh, take it away, Laura. Thank you. So, uh, you, know, you know, thank you for having me here to talk about our work in um, deep immune profiling of MIS-C, which is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome uh, in children. And um, when I say our work, I, I want to emphasize up front that, um, you know, work of this scope that, that happened in real time during the first wave of the pandemic was a, a massive team effort. And so I'm, I'm highlighting uh, co-first authors uh, here at the bottom, uh, part of the, the Wary Laboratory, um, the, the laboratory of Michael Betts, and then um, from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, the dysregulated immunity team um, that made you know, recruitment of uh, these critical pediatric samples uh, possible. So just to begin, I, I wanna talk about uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and uh, from the child to adult con continuum and, and how we, we think about it. So I think, um, you know, in, in general, we all have this sense that there's a way to do it right, right? Sometimes the immune system, when challenged with this novel pathogen, develops this ideal center point of effective immunity, where you may have mildly symptomatic uh, disease, you end up having really adequate control of the virus, and, um, you know, very nicely coordinated uh, immune response that also allows either, um, you know, not much tissue damage or, or repair of tissue that the, that the virus may have directly damaged. And that on either side of that, you know, there could be issues. So if you have a, a vigorous or a, an uncoordinated immune response, you can have immunopathology. And if somebody is immunosuppressed um, for various reasons, um, although not all of them, there can be, again, issues with um, lack of control of the virus. And, and I think we are often very used to, as um, immunologists and scientists, um, thinking about uh, the immune system along this disease severity spectrum. But I think the other axis we can learn a lot from is, is rotating things and looking instead on, uh, around the spectrum of age. Uh, how do children respond to this infection? Um, what can we learn uh, from adults that apply to kids and kids that apply to adults and vice versa? So I think the, the main translational questions that we had when, when all of this started were, what types of immune responses occur in adults versus children? Are there common pathways of immune activation or immune response? Do those pathways relate to clinical features of disease? And you know, ideally, are there things we can learn from a, a pipeline of, of understanding SARS-CoV-2 related illness that would allow us to tailor treatments um, based on a patient's age or the, the particular disease presentation. I think these are all the thoughts we were, we were having at the beginning of the pandemic. And so what I'm showing you here is a, is a timeline of our pipeline launch. And I wanna emphasize that you know, this began as a, a massive effort at the University of Pennsylvania. Many, many um, groups were, were involved. Um, and what you're seeing here in orange is the uh, case counts that happened during the first wave in Philadelphia where we are located. 
Um, and then in this uh, magenta bar is when uh, many of us uh, put our heads together and began uh, rapidly planning how we were going to learn as much as we could um, to be able to um, respond to patients and, and deal with this, this new challenge as quickly as possible. And so what we did um, was to stand up a, a fairly robust and very labor intensive uh, pipeline to be able to collect adult samples when, when um, adults came into uh, the hospital. And we were able to receive our first sample from a, an, an adult admitted to the intensive care unit um, on March 23rd. And um, right before then, um, I was contacted by an employee who had a known uh, po prior positive PCR, which was uncommon at that point um, in the local pandemic, um, to ask if there was anything they could do to help. And so what we also did uh, during this time was expand our adult healthy donor standing protocol we already had existing to not only recruit now um, healthy uninfected adults, but also to recruit uh, recovered donors to understand the full spectrum um, of disease. And so um, by the end of March, we were you know, acquiring both healthy, recovered, and acutely ill adult samples. And so what we did after collecting all of these samples is put them through a pipeline that really required um, uh, multiple steps in a given day. So these samples were all processed um, fresh, no cryo preservation. Uh, a sample would be collected, brought to the laboratory, which became uh, called the um, the COVID processing unit. Samples would be processed either for whole blood staining or processed for PBMC. Those PBMC would be stained and then they would be um, run the next day. And so this really high quality immune profiling uh, data from flow cytometry um, was uh, then combined with serology with plasma cytokines. And then um, because these were all partnered with uh, Nula Meyer from our um, intensive care unit group, the critical care team, we were also able to pair um, the immunologic data with a, a high dimensional uh, clinical data. And, and so before we talk about children, I, I first wanna tell you what we learned about adults um, uh, in this one slide so that you can uh, understand the comparison and I'll, I'll be including the adults as comparators when I, when I talk about pediatric disease. So as I said, we collected healthy donors, recovered donors, and um, patients with COVID-19 who, as the colors darken here, um, had varying degrees or increasing severity of illness. And what you can see is that if you look on a per cell basis, basis this is um, mapped single cell data from flow, um, the healthy donors and recovered donors actually uh, looked fairly similar in CD8 T cells and B cells. I mean, they were in, in um, common areas of this map. Uh, whereas patients admitted with COVID-19 occupied a, a, a different portion of that, um, of that map. And when we look, instead of on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, on a patient-by-patient -patient basis using UMAP for uh, dimensionality reduction, taking those uh, 200 flow cytometric features, you can see that by and large, the healthy and recovered donors uh, cluster together and subjects with um, acute illness clustered together and then the in severity increased as you moved here along uh, component one. And so this paper uh, was published uh, in June in, in science by the, you know, uh, the large group of us who were, who were working on this. And we, we used it to define general immunotypes with, um, you know, that may correspond to varying degrees of severity. But I think what's um, really quite interesting is, is how patients progressed over time uh, in, in their hospitalization course, which is to say that while recovered donors return to a, a, a healthy appearance within several weeks of their infection, when you look at the first week of, it, of admission for a patient with acute COVID, they actually um, remain quite similar in their cellular uh, activation. And you, know, you can see when we look at activation of CD8 T cells, that the majority of adults admitted to the hospital either maintained the same degree of activation as defined by HLA-DR and CD38, or actually increased their CD8 T cell activation. And it was really a minority of patients who actually um, demonstrated uh, um, immune sort of quiescence as their hospitalization progressed. 
I think um, at that time, if you'll recall, there was a lot of talk about whether kids were getting the virus, whether they were getting it and just not having symptoms, whether they were sort of resistant somehow naturally to infection, uh, generally a curiosity as to why children were underrepresented in cases. Because uh, even though about a quarter of the population is pediatric, um, uh, fewer than 10% or around 10% of cases are at that time were reflected in children. And, and fortunately, not only were cases rare in children, but the hospitalization rate and then the mortality rate um, in children were, were incredibly low. And, and these great, um, you know, great things for the health of our, of our kids uh, really also led us to some questions again about how children and adult immune responses uh, relate to one another. You know, I think the question easily is, if you, you know, are these kids having the exact same immune response as adults, but they're dealing with it better? Or do they get exposed to this virus and their immune system responds in a completely uh, different way? So um, as, as a result of these questions, thinking that we might be able to learn so much about this severe adult disease by studying children, we um, partnered with the immune dysregulation team at the hospital um, I work in, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, to um, ask uh, the same questions of the pediatric samples. And so we received our first pediatric sample in the um, first week of May, and we're able to uh, collect samples and include them in our adult pipeline um, throughout the months of um, April, uh, May, and June. Um, of course, during that time, while we were collecting these samples, and again, the goal was to understand adult disease through the pediatric lens, um, the NHS uh, issued on April 27th an alert about this new inflammatory syndrome. Um, and shortly thereafter, we began in our hospital to see a peak. So this is the community peak here, um, peaking in early April, and then we began to see uh, a peaking uh, in early May of uh, cases that fit, fit this sort of inflammatory syndrome uh, concept. And then in the middle of, the May, of May, the CDC uh, issued a health advisory for uh, what is now, at least in this country, called MIS-C or the multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children. And I think for us, we really didn't know until this announcement was made that um, that this was happening. And certainly we now know that we had at least one patient in the middle of May who, whose case flummoxed us, us all because we, we couldn't figure out what was going on that we now recognize uh, to have been uh, the first recognized case in our hospital of Miss C. So after that, you know, many, many cases began uh, to be reported, including huge case series pub published in the New England Journal. And uh, to date now, we are a year into this pandemic and we have um, experienced in our country, in the United States, uh, 3,185 cases of Miss C and uh, 36 cases of death associated with this um, illness. So I, I, you know, before I, I tell you about the immunology of, of this syndrome, I first wanna make sure that um, everyone knows sort of what it is. I think there's been a, a huge amount of press about this Kawasaki-like syndrome early on, um, but really what, what we have as a case definition from the CDC is a child um, or somebody under the age of 21 who's presenting with fever. They have to have some laboratory evidence of inflammation and they need to be ill enough to be admitted to the hospital. Um, once you meet those criteria, which a, a lot of children meet with routine hospitalizations, then there has to be um, two organ systems involved, no alternative diagnosis, and then um, positive for uh, SARS-CoV testing, either by PCR or uh, serology. Um, so that's, that's the case definition. Uh, what we actually see in the hospital, just to, to give you a sense of, of what this, what's, what this looks like at the bedside, is that typically what we have is we have a school-aged child who is previously healthy, um, brought in by their parents because they are now sick um, and they have a fever. In the majority of these children, we either see um, a rash and or conjunctivitis or you know pink, pink and the white of the eye. And the rash very commonly takes on this sort of annular, like a ring-like plaque shape um, on the trunk. You'll often see it on the um, upper uh, thighs. Uh, and these kids um, very often have really severe abdominal pain. So the MMR, uh, MMWR data suggests about 62% with severe abdominal pain. 
And then any gastrointestinal involvement, so an episode of vomiting or diarrhea happens in the majority of, of children. These children, um, very much unlike Kawasaki disease, um, often require admission to the intensive care unit and also often require blood pressure support um, with uh, epinephrine, for example. Um, they can require respiratory support as well, but they are, they are quite sick when they, um, when they progress in this uh, illness. And then, I, you know, I think the, the last feature I, I want to point out to you that is, um, I think, relevant here for the immunology of this uh, novel syndrome is that it is very common to um, now have family members with documented infection three to four weeks prior. When testing was hard to get, um, this was a little harder for us to establish. But um, for example, when I was taking care of children with Miss C the week of December 28th, the most common story of exposure that uh, I heard involved the word Thanksgiving. Um, so this is a Thanksgiving to New Year's. Um, the child you know, is generally exposed to this, this virus about a month before they pre present with um, Miss C. And so this is reflected here where the community peak of COVID-19 is generally staggered by about a month uh, with the community peak or the hospital admission peak of this inflammatory syndrome in children. And, and I think you know, that, that brings the, the big question we've all had and we still don't have a complete answer to, which is you know, what is this? Uh, what in fact is this syndrome? What is going on? I mean, I think obviously it, it seems immunediated, right? It is an highly inflammatory syndrome. Um, and the treatment we give intravenous immunoglobulin and steroids um, leads to really a good recovery for most children within the week um, and they, they do quite well if you are seeing them in the clinic, you know, a month or more later. Um, you know, so what, in, in order to, to understand this, what we ended up doing was collecting these samples from the children with COVID-19 and children with MIS-C and plugging them directly into this pipeline. And so again, these are samples that are not cryopreserved. They are processed um, same day, and they were run alongside our healthy recovered and adult COVID-19 subjects so that we can not only understand MISI and COVID and pediatric COVID-19 as they compare to one another, but we can also understand them uh, as they relate to ad adult disease for which we have um, you know, much, much more information uh, in the literature. Uh, in, together, we had uh, 14 subjects with, with Miss C um, who can, you know, consented to have blood drawn during this April to June time point, um, 16 subjects with uh, pediatric COVID-19. And we split um, the samples uh, between having a PBMC or a lymphocyte flow cytometry panel, which I'll mostly talk about today, um, as well as a whole blood uh, flow cytometry uh, panel performed. And as I go through, um, you'll see pediatric COVID-19 broken into two colors. We've broke dark blue as patients with ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. These are very, very, very ill uh, children um, who typically remain in the hospital for weeks and will look much like the sickest adults in terms of their disease uh, course. And then children who had um, minimally uh, symptomatic, uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 PCR positivity. Um, and then Miss C will be reflected in these green triangles. So the first thing I, you know, I just want to show is that yes, these children are tremendously inflamed. These are typical laboratory markers of inflammation, CRP, uh, ferritin. They have evidence of uh, vascular involvement with increases in troponin and D-dimer. Um, but it, this inflammation is happening across all presentations of SARS-CoV-2 infection. It is not limited. Uh, to Miss C, uh, even though it is quite uh, striking in Miss C. But what we do see um, that, that relates to what's been shown in adults um, is that the absolute lymphocyte count um, in the peripheral blood of these patients in the hospital is quite low on admission. And in adults, um, the ALC has been associated, like the lower ALC um, has been associated with more severe disease. And you can see that even when you look at the children with the most uh, severe disease that they um, also have a low ALC. So we can see that these kids come in with a, a fairly low uh, number of total lymphocytes in the blood. And then we ask, um, you know, what lymphocytes are particularly low? Uh, the answer here is uh, T cells. So what I'm showing you now, and it will be the, reflected throughout um, these figures, is that 
we, I will have, you know, on the right side of the hash line, the pediatric samples, and on the left side, completely uh, comparable, run in parallel uh, adult samples, where gray will reflect healthy donors, and then, um, you know, adults with COVID-19 will have increasing severity groupings reflected by the, the darkening of this uh, pinkish shade. And so what you can see here is children with Miss C had low T cell numbers that were on par with uh, the more ill adults and that the losses were both in CD4 and CD8 T cells, um, although CD8 T cells may uh, account for a slightly greater, uh, greater loss. Uh, but interesting, when we look at the T cells that are remaining, you can see that both in CD4 T cells in this top row and CD8 T cells in the bottom row, that um, there is marked activation of these cells where CD4 T cells are, are quite activated and that correlates as well with KI67 expression, uh, but especially the CD8 T cells in Miss C are um, not just you know, very activated, but they are at or above the levels of activation observed in the very sickest adults. So I think you know, as we as we saw this this result, we see these these kids who are ill in front of us, these kids who can respond really well to our immune modulation, but whose immune activation um, seems to look as if they should be very much like these uh, adults who are who are intubated, you know, across the street for us. This, this question is why are these T cells activated? Um, as I said, this is a month after these children were likely infected or exposed to. Uh, this virus. And so the, the clear question for all of us is, are these cells that are activated, activated in response to SARS-CoV-2? Is this viral antigen that is a month later still driving this process or is it, is it something else? Um, in, when we were thinking about viral antigen, I think it becomes important to, to know that um, in, in national cases, somewhere between 30 and 50% of children are actually still SARS-CoV-2 RNA positive from the nose at the time of admission. So in, in our cohort, it's around 80%. And although they have a higher cycle threshold, i.e. lower um, RNA in the starting material, um, it's still there. There's still RNA detectable there. And, and while I think most people speculate that this is likely not infectious virus that we are um, detecting in the nose. Um, it is a, a, at least consistent with the idea that from an antigenic uh, standpoint, as far as the T cells might be concerned, that there is still um, antigen around. And so one of the questions we asked when we're looking at the activated T cells is whether any of the T cells we can see um, you know, have evidence of a chronic antigen uh, response or what might be called like an exhausted uh, response. And so first um, we, we looked at PD-1, which as uh, you know, is not just a marker of e exhausted cells, but also can be upregulated um, clearly in, in activation and especially robust uh, viral responses. Um, and so you, you can see, of course, Ms. C, patients with Miss C in both uh, CD4 on the top and CD8 on the bottom T cells have um, high expression of PD-1 that is at or above the levels of um, the sickest adults. Um, but when we try to then look specifically at exhaustion, we add um, the surface protein CD39, which while not um, a definitive marker of exhaustion, PD-1 and CD39 co-expression does um, in, in humans enriched for uh, exhausted cells. And we can see that in um, children with Miss C that they had much higher uh, proportions of their, of, of their um, uh, T cells expressing uh, PD-1 and CD39, which would be consistent with a, a, a persisting antigen, but of course is not uh, demonstrative of that. You know, the, the next thing that, that we wanted to understand uh, focused on the crux of this illness. So, you know, children have fever all the time. Children have rashes all the time. Um, these are, children have conjunctivitis all the time. These are not major issues. The, the major issue, the critical issue of Miss C is well, one of the vascular system. Um, the majority of children have cardiovascular involvement in their disease. Um, where you know the, the numbers at our hospital are around 64% of the patients who are included in these data required admission to the intensive care unit so that they could receive blood pressure support. Um, there's cardiac dysfunction observed. There's um, coronary artery dilations or, or aneurysms observed, uh, blood pressure changes, et, et cetera. Um, 
and really trying to understand what is causing that um, is, I think, at the key of, of uh, trying to understand the pathophysiology of this disease. And so in, in doing you know, our digging around with the data that we have, we, we decided to look at a known um, T cell subset that can interact with the vasculature to ask whether these were at all uh, altered uh, in this C. And so the cells we decided to <clears throat> look at here will be familiar to many of you. They are uh, CX3, CR1 positive, um, or fractal kind receptor positive CD8 T cells. And um, you know, many people will study these cells in, in multiple contexts, but from the vascular perspective, um, these cells are known to be able to inter in, um, interact with fractal kind uh, expressing um, blood vessels, uh, especially in diseases of chronic infection, HIV, um, et cetera. And so what you can see here is a scheme where uh, generalized inflammation will lead to endothelial uh, cell expression of fractal kind, which will call in fractal kind, uh, CX3CR1 positive uh, CD8 T cells, which can then extravasate into the tissue, cause more inflammation and, and create a, an inflammatory uh, cycle for the vasculature. Uh, in, in adult diseases where these cells are involved in inflammation, there's typically an increase of CX3CR1 positive cells uh, in, um, or these sort of vascular patrolling cells in um, the peripheral blood. But actually, when we um, looked in our subjects, we, we didn't see that at all. We saw um, very similar distribution of, of these cells across uh, all disease types in adults and um, in children. But then when we um, assessed the activation status of uh, these cells, we were able to um, determine that, especially in CD8 T cells, the, um, pro the proportion of um, these sort of vascular patrolling cells that were activated in MIS-C um, you know, blew all other categories of, of patients out of the water. Um, and the, the only sort of corresponding adult patient uh, reflected here um, had a T cell uh, uh, malignancy. Um, so we, we noticed that there was a, a preferential activation of CX3CR1 positive cells, even compared to uh, CX3CR1 uh, negative cells uh, in MIS-C. But we can also see that there exists um, activation of these cells in other in, in adults and in um, children with acute COVID-19. And, and so we wondered whether here Ms. C was giving us an opportunity to interrogate uh, the biology of this uh, continuum of, of disease that sort of starts with acute illness and can progress to a longer form or a, a Ms. C form, um, the role of, of these cells in, in vascular manifestations. And so what we first did was to look at all pediatric patients and, and ask whether the presence of these activated vascular patrolling cells correlated with known uh, features of, of vascular disease. And so you can see that um, they correlated with uh, D-dimer, um, they correlated with low platelets, which can be seen in vascular disease. And, and most importantly, um, when we asked which patients required intensive care unit admission for um, uh, blood pressure support like epinephrine, you can see that the presence of these cells was um, much higher uh, or, or higher in patients who required uh, vasoactive support. You know, we, we then asked because we saw these, um, these elevated frequencies in adults as well, whether similar relationships existed in adult populations. And what you can see here is that uh, when we look at um, what our best marker for uh, vascular disease in adults is um, from our data set, uh, uh, suspected or confirmed thrombotic complications listed here, you can see that um, patients who had uh, known thrombotic complications um, had higher proportions of activated uh, vascular patrolling cells, and they did not have a higher, I'm not showing here, proportion of the CX3, CR1 negative activated cells. So we think that um, the, the activation of these T cells um, is, is a clue here uh, for vascular inflammation, but I think that the chicken and the egg uh, still remains uh, an, important, an important question. Uh, I just wanna briefly say from the, from the whole blood cytometry data, where we looked at um, multiple other types of cell subsets that you can see here, that um, the phenotype changes in the activation we see in, in MIS-C is not limited to uh, conventional uh, lymphocytes. Um, and we, we see CD38 expressed um, highly on uh, NK, T, I mean, NK cells, as well as um, uh, mate cells in MIS-C as compared to pediatric COVID-19. 
So um, that's the T cell data where I am showing you that we have uh, tremendous activation in MIS-C, that it is higher than pediatric COVID-19, although of course the, there's an overlap in the spectrum, and that it is as high, if not higher, than is observed in, um, in uh, um, very the, the illest adults, uh, and that these activated cells are particularly um, observed in the CX3CR1 or, or vascular controlling uh, compartment. So next, I, I want to talk about humoral immunity in MIS-C and to discuss like, what we might expect and, and, and how this could play a role in disease. So uh, you know, first, again, back to this issue of timing, which I think is the, is the critical, is the, is the linchpin of, of MIS-C as an entity. It is a delayed event um, after exposure to virus. And so we know that when somebody is infected or vaccinated, that their peak plasma blast response or the B cells responding to uh, that infection um, or challenge, you know, occurs one to two weeks after that, uh, that infection. And when we look at adult COVID-19 and the plasma blast responses, that's what we see. So in green is healthy and red here are um, acute uh, COVID-19 adult samples. And what you can see is that when you, th these patients are admitted, which is typically in that second week um, of illness, they have a really robust plasma blast response on the order of um, that we see with, you know, yellow fever vaccine or Ebola. And so we know MIS-C is not coming in at this point in time, right? We know MIS-C is coming in weeks later. So we wanted to know what should we expect then when these subjects are, are coming in a month after exposure or six weeks after their exposure uh, to this virus. And so what we did was to look at our recovered donors and to look at their plasma blast responses over a period of, uh, of time since the days of their symptoms start, which we had recorded for each of the recovered donors, where the gray bar reflects the, um, the normal range. And, and what you can see is that when you get to the window of time where our patients with MIS-C would be coming into the hospital, recovered donors who sort of had that optimal in the middle green response, um, because these were all outpatients uh, to SARS-CoV-2 infection, have already resolved the frequencies of plasma blasts in their blood, assuming that they were um, above normal even at the time of their initial infection. Um, and so we wanted to know when we look at our data, how does this fit? Do the, do the children with acute COVID look like acute adult COVID and do the children with MIS-C look like um, more convalescent or recovered donors? So when we look in acute COVID-19, you can see the distribution of plasma blast frequency is actually just like we would expect in adults, they're high. Um, they are having a, a B cell response uh, to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but when we look in um, MIS-C, actually while we expected um, from a recovered donor standpoint that they should be back down here where our gray healthy donors are, um, instead we see that there is a either continued or new uh, plasma blast response uh, in these subjects. But because we don't have samples, from two weeks prior or three weeks prior, we don't know whether um, you know, this, they had a low plasma blast response that then increased or whether they've had a high one the entire time. Um, but we do know they, they mount very effective um, IgG responses. So it's not as if patients with MIS-C did not develop a B cell response initially and then are developing one. Because when these patients come in, they um, clearly have a uh, you know, typical IgG titers against uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection um, at the time of presentation. When we, when we look at these plasma blasts, which are abnormally or persistently elevated in MIS-C, we can see that a higher proportion of them are expressing a TBET, uh, which can be associated with antiviral isotype switching, but is also associated with age, autoimmunity, and some uh, disorganized or extrafollicular uh, B cell responses. Um, interestingly, though, if you think about um, the adult data and how adults um, progress over time in the hospital, what we did see is that in, in MIS-C here, if we plot um, TBET frequencies and plasma blast frequencies from days since admission, once we treat these children, their plasma blast numbers return to um, normal as indicated in the gray bar and the frequency of their plasma blasts that express TBET again re return to normal. So whatever is triggering this um, exuberant response, um, at least you know, phenotypically in the blood, um, you know, that response is, a, is abated by, um, by our immunomodulatory therapies. So you know, next what we did 
was to ask, well, we have, we've looked at these specific T cell responses and B cell responses, but this was high parameter cytometry. So how do these patients look when we analyze them using all 200 plus features that we could from uh, flow cytometry? And, and so what we did was to take that, uh, that flow cytometry with all adult and pediatric samples um, and do use all 207 of those features to sort of build a, um, a UMAP uh, for high dimensional space uh, visualization. And, and what you can see here, uh, much like the adult data I showed earlier, and some of these patients are reflected, but, but reanalyzed, um, is that again, healthy um, adults cluster on one side of the map and then um, adults with acute COVID-19 cluster on the other. And what you see is that our MIS-C patients cluster at this sort of high component one and component two space um, for, uh, you know, along with some of the more ill adults. And some of the um, subjects with uh, just COVID-19 or the more mild form of COVID-19 even still clustered with, um, with healthy adult subjects. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, one of the really interesting features here is one of time, not just time space between COVID-19 and MIS-C, but also um, as you'll recall, when adults are admitted with th their severe illness, they either maintain or increase their um, immune activation uh, during the hospitalization. And so we next asked what was happening in our children with MIS-C who in front of our eyes appear to be clinically getting better. You know, what is happening uh, to their immune systems uh, other than just the plasmablast and, and TBET uh, responses over time. And, and so first I'm gonna show you data from the patients with ARDS. This is that very adult-like presentation of uh, severe COVID-19 illness where the subjects are uh, um, these patients are intubated for prolonged period of, periods of time. And what you can see is if you follow patients around time as we um, um, were serially collecting samples is that they, they move around in UMAP space, but they, they tend to stay um, sort of with this outer rim of, of uh, severe uh, illness. And in contrast, when we um, look at our subjects with MIS-C, who um, had their second flow cytometry time point um, in the days before uh, discharge from the hospital, you can see that they in, in general moved towards the area of either less severe illness or other, you know, the, some subjects with um, who are healthy adults. You know, when we then take it back out to the individual T cell responses, most of these CD8 T cell abnormalities are in fact correcting in the short period of time that our subjects are in the hospital. So activation, that generalized activation of all non-naive CD8 T cells, the uh, proliferative signal, the, you know, the activation comes back down to normal. Whereas when we look over time with pa to, against patients with ARDS, they uh, do um, indeed uh, tend to remain uh, activated in their CD8 T cell compartment. Um, and when we look at these cells that I was calling sort of more exhaustion enriched earlier, um, you can see that also after therapy, these subjects with MIS-C really reduce the frequency of, of those uh, exhaustion type uh, CD8 T cells in the blood. Um, but not everything goes all the way back down to normal. Um, the frequency of CX3, CR1 activated CD8 T cells um, is uh, decreasing, but hasn't quite hit this, this gray bar that, um, that reflects uh, healthy. And that, that's also reflected in some of the laboratory values. While CRP corrects, um, subjects still have a relatively elevated ferritin and relatively elevated uh, D-dimer when they're about a week into uh, hospitalization. So I think, you know, this brings the, um, the general open questions about the pathogenesis of MIS-C. And, and the first one is whether a persisting viral antigen, you know, plays a role or whether this is entirely a post-viral event. We, we know it's happening after the infection, but is it after the antigen is gone? I mean, I, our, our data would suggest no, that there's still some antigen around, but we don't know what converts uh, these T cells into, um, into a disease state or the plasmablasts into a disease state or whatever the, the driving uh, cellular response is. And, and I think the really Im important question here is one of the specificity of these activated TNB cells. 
you know, are they specific for SARS-CoV-2? If they are, that is a major clue that this is a, a process driven directly by the viral infection and that this is a late manifestation of a, a viral um, of, of, of virus. Um, but it's also possible that what we are seeing is that these activated TNB cells are reactive to self. And there's been some groups who've looked at uh, autoantibody responses, but I think there's still a, a lot of work to be done to, to understand the specificity. And, and, then, and then finally, there are um, some groups who are now um, interested in the concept of a super antigen or a, a, a lack of a unified specificity for these TNB cells that they are being triggered and non-specifically um, and, and causing this disease. But I think a, a tremendous amount would be need to, needed to be understood about how then we, we end up with a late manifestation with this four week delay um, in this C. And then finally, um, one, one of the real questions I have is, is what these immune responses look like just before disease onset. So like I said, these kids do not experience symptomatic um, COVID-19. So if we go back to, the example I gave of the patients presenting a New Year's week um, who were exposed to SARS-CoV-2 um, on Thanksgiving, you know, what did they look like December 12th? Um, did they have completely quiescent immune systems? Did they have a bump in, in their inflammatory signatures that just never rose to the uh, point of causing any symptomatology? Because again, these children are, um, are asymptomatic. Um, and, or, or, you know, is, is there a, a smoldering the entire time that then um, sort of tips over uh, in, the, in the last week just before they present? I think these are, these are really in, important questions to understand uh, what's happening. And, and one of the things we are doing um, to, to understand the earlier phase of this disease is rather than waiting until children are admitted to the hospital and, and diagnosed with Miss C, we are now collecting samples in the emergency room from um, patients who come in and have uh, are suspected of having Miss C. So they most likely don't, but they might. And we are getting blood samples from these patients so that um, in the end, we can have a group who was eventually diagnosed with Miss C and a group who was not. And we can compare um, markers to be able to know you know, what do these kids look like before any immune modulation is given? Uh, and is there a way to diagnose them, I think most critically, before they get sick? Um, you know, much of the time when these children come to the hospital, they don't need blood pressure support right away. Sometimes they do, but often this is something that can develop over several days. So to be able to be able to diagnose this entity um, before the immune system sort of takes off and their blood pressure drops uh, to be able to treat it before those events happen and prevent the intensive care unit admissions in the first place would be a, a major goal. And I think an important one, um, given that uh, you know, vaccines for the school age child are you know, having studies just being started now. And so we are you know, in for another uh, several months, unfortunately, of um, trying to diagnose, um, uh, understand, and, and treat uh, Miss C. And so uh, with that, I would just like, again, to um, thank uh, the huge team of people who worked uh, tremendously hard to uh, you know, produce this work, including uh, co-first authors uh, on this paper and, and the team uh, largely from the Wary Lab, the Betts Lab, the, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, this regulated immunity team, the Scott Hensley Lab, and um, uh, the, the folks at uh, the University of Pennsylvania Critical Care, uh, and, and all the work that went into processing these samples uh, right away so we get the highest quality information. So thank you. All right. Um, thanks, Laura. A great talk on a very important topic. Um, and I really liked how you started the talk explaining the distinction between Kawasaki disease and MSC, because it's really important. Um, all right, time for questions. Uh, audience, a reminder, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we will call you to ask your questions, so we'll be more than happy to read out your questions for you. So as you're waiting for the audience question, um, let me get started. Um, so we saw that Missy is pretty rare. Uh, so clearly SARS-CoV-2 is inducing such a damaging inflammatory response in some children, but not in the others. 
So I'm just wondering if there is some kind of a genetic predisposition that kind of, you know, predisposes these kids to uh, this, uh, you know, immune response, or is there some underlying health conditions that could make them more susceptible to Missy? Um, what's your take on that? I think right now the answer is we don't know and we don't know. Um, I, I think the, there are risks. You know, there, there's been re recent data coming out of the CDC about uh, risk factors associated with um, MIS-C, but these are all sort of shades of gray. Uh, the, the primary type of child who would come in is a previously healthy child with no prior known medical conditions um, who is of school age. It can happen... Um, to child from, children from um, multiple ethnicities, um, multiple regions. It's happened during multiple phases of the, of the virus and we've had you know, different strains coming through. Uh, it, it, I, I don't know that there's going to be a unifying uh, explanation other than perhaps this, this disease causes a spectrum and there may be a common difference in how these children either uh, experience the virus or manage the virus that just makes them a setup to be able to uh, develop this syndrome later on. All right, fair enough. Uh, but um, do you even suspect that there could be some kind of uh, like something an autoimmune disease or yes, something? no, there there could there could be. Um, but these children, so we've only been able to follow these children for several months after, you know, at, at most a year after now. Um, I don't think we've, we've had a signal that they are going on to develop autoimmune issues or, or other things. Um, but of course, this, this is why there's a lot of studies set up now to follow these children long term. But so mm -hmm. far as we can tell, the vast majority of children return to being healthy children. Um, so it's the, it's the best case scenario, and, and hopefully that continues and occurs for, for most uh, children who acquire this. But, but right now, we, we, do not, we do not know, um, you know what it is that would make one child at, at risk for this and another not. Sure. Thanks. Uh, all right, audience, um, if you have a question from Allison. Uh, yeah, right. uh, yeah, Allison, um, unmute yourself and um, we'll get you to ask your question. How about Brian? Can you turn on Brian? Okay, uh, I'm going to read out Allison's question. Any thoughts okay. about why the interval is varied between SARS-CoV-2 exposure and development of MIS-C? Um, yes, I mean, I we, we all have thoughts, uh, and and the that is the that is the crux of the illness. It exists because of this delay. I think that's that's quite clear, or else we would see this MIS-C syndrome in early on in infection. Um, I, I am leaning more towards the idea that there is some persisting um, antigen and, and that maybe there is a, an evolution of, of how that antigen is, is managed in the body over that period of time that may then set up a, a, a different kind of response. And whether that response is antivirus, anti-self, uh, I don't know. Um, but uh, I think the, the time the time is, is a really critical part of this disease. It's not just happenstance. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, a lot of our previous speakers have shown um, evidence of pockets of persistent viral infection, even six to nine months out. So this would not be crazy at all. <laughs> right. I think, I think it's something we don't know anything. And so I think at this point, it's really important for us all to keep our minds very, very open. And so you'll, you'll hear me often answering questions in, in, a, uh, in a way that makes me sound uh, agnostic, but that's because I think I'm trying to remain that way um, because I, I think assumptions won't help us here. Mm -hmm. okay. Hey, Brian, ask your question. Thank you so much for this excellent, excellent talk. Um, I have a question about if, if there's any data already on the how new variants are affecting uh, infection in children and or MIS-C. Not, not in a robust way. Um, we are seeing, we've seen MIS-C happen after every peak. You know, there's a COVID peak and then a MIS-C peak. We've, we've seen that march throughout the country. Um, and certainly it's happened in, in our region um, at, at least twice now. Uh, but we, we haven't been able to tie whether the, the variants themselves are, are going to be increasing our rates, decreasing our rates. And, and some of that may just relate to what the base frequency of, 
uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection is in the community. If a variant is, is causing more infection in the community, then we might expect to see more cases of MIS-C. But right now, we haven't been able to get a signal that a variant is um, you know, higher for any given child that being infected with variant X or variant Y is going to set them up to be more likely to develop Miss C. That's not known. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Laura, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in now. I've got a bunch. That's a super provocative talk. Um, so I love that you um, presented us with the um, unknown, unsolved questions, and let's just dive right in. So um, how, how are you and others planning on figuring out the specificity of the T and B cell response? So I think B cells are actually a little easier um, you know, because we can use B cell probes to um, yeah. just directly assess. There's some limitation in that these samples are uh, cryopreserved and so we can, mm. um, we, we'll lose some of the plasma blasts and things, but I think we'll have enough to be able to to look at B cell specificity, so that, that's a that's a that's a to do. Uh, the I mean, and then then like circulating antib antibodies as well. You're going to do ELISAs against so, you know a number so of things. That's okay. I mean that's been done um, by by multiple groups in the sense that we know these children has have SARS CoV two specific antibody. They have specific IgG. They have specific IgA. Um, the functional the FC end of that has uh, recently been explored by uh, Galip Alter's group. Uh, you know, there may be some FC differences, but I think in general, they're making a SARS-CoV-2 specific antibody. Mm -hmm. I, I think the corollary is, of, of course, they're going to have SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells. I mean, that they mm -hmm. have them would, you'd have to disprove to me that they, you know, that they um, don't have them. I've lost myself in the negatives, but the, <laughs> they, they're gonna have them. They had this infection, they have specific antibody, they should have specific T cells. I yeah. think the question that's a little harder here, especially when we have diverse HLA groups and we don't have tetramers, is to say, yes, but when we look directly ex vivo at those very activated cells, what mm -hmm. is the specificity of those very activated cells? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's harder to do because of a, lo a lot of our antigen specificity assays rely on inducing activation. Mm -hmm. So to do it in the, in the reverse and say, well, if they're activated, then against what? Um, yeah. is a bit harder. I mean, are, are you guys going to elude and sequence peptides from the MHC or? So uh, the, the current approach um, here uh, personally is, is to, is to pause. And I know this sounds a little odd, but these are, these are small volume samples. Kids right. don't, we don't get as much blood from children as from adults. And so the, the goal here is to let the first um, all the first papers come out uh, to see yeah. what we can see so that when we ask our next stage question, that it is the right question given all the data uh, in the field. And so we haven't made the commitment for the T cell assays yet because we want it to be mm -hmm. uh, just right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then next thing on your list, I'm super curious about the, the super antigen um, hypothesis. You know, I did some quick Googling it seems that, you know, right near the polybasic cleavage site is uh, a, a mimic of um, staph and teratoxin. It, I mean, is that the super antigen that you, you think might be being I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm even more agnostic. If, if you could be well, scales of agnostic, I'm even more agnostic yeah. about the super antigen concept and then yeah. um, about virus. But I, you know, you would have to, in, in order to get from, you know, spike, from the initial infection to spike being a super antigen, there would have to be some processing step or else we would be seeing this in adults. I mean, there aren't, toxic shock syndrome happens in adults. So we still have to wrestle with the fact that this is a very, while there may be features of it across the age continuum, this profound presentation is really, really age restricted. Mm -hmm. So we have to integrate what could be a, a viral protein specific trigger for a super antigen response with, a, the fact that it only happens in a, in a limited age group, and B, the fact that it is delayed. You would mm -hmm. think that these responses happen in the, in the bolus phase. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it, there's, it is very possible. We just have to resolve some of these things that I think don't fit perfectly. Yeah. Okay, I've got some super practical questions too. So like, how do you treat these kids? Do, do you do like steroids, interferon? Like what do you, what do you do? We, we initially, you know, if you, as you mentioned, they, they, 
when they first presented, these children looked to our eyes to be similar to Kawasaki disease. And that is treated with I, I, intravenous immunoglobulin and aspirin. Yeah, right. so we, started, we started there. Um, oh. But not all kids uh, with MIS-C respond as well as we would like with uh, IVIG and aspirin. And so very often, um, more and more than half the time, we add on steroids. And the two mm. of those things together do quite well. Um, mm. that, that is the, the backbone. Of and this is, this is just gamma globulin or do you guys do like SARS-CoV-2 specific no. therapy? No. Okay. No, so, so intravenous immunoglobulin for reasons that are uh, not, not fully clear to anybody um, is immunomodulatory when you give uh, large doses of it. And so that yes. is, <laughs> uh, um, that's the, that is the, the treatment. Um, and, yeah. But the steroids seem particularly important for some children. Mm. Oh, um, adding to treatment. Uh, so you showed that the chemokine receptors are involved. So mm -hmm. have you uh, a chemokine receptor blockers? Uh, would those be, I mean, I don't know if they are even suitable. I, for the kid. Yeah, I think um, so in the, in most cases, our, our simpler treatments work. Um, and so I think you would have to, you know, have a pretty high barrier of evidence to, to deviate from what works. I think the question is in the children who maybe come in later or we're having more difficulty getting to, re to respond to initial therapy, are there uh, treatments that would, um, you know, potentially make quiescent these vascular patrolling cells that, that could be helpful in this disease and or in vascular manifestations of um, mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2 infection more broadly? And I, I think that is um, certainly something to think about, especially as we're, we're unlikely to be uncovering something brand new. This is probably in, in the Venn diagram of diseases uh, overlapped with, with other pathophysiologic processes. So what we can learn from here may help us um, not just with this, but with, with other similar entities going forward. So it, it is something we've certainly discussed. Mm -hmm. And do you think the aspirin is helping through the blood thinning activity or some other anti-inflammatory response? You, to be honest, we, I, I want to be clear. We don't, we don't know that aspirin is helping. One of the limitations yeah. here is we, um, and I'm not saying aspirin isn't helping. It's what we do for right. Kawasaki. It's, it's part of our, yeah. our, our cardiac um, sort of prevention measures there. It is, it is thought to be through its um, sort of, um, as you put, I guess, blood thinning properties. But I yeah. think um, we, we're not, we haven't tested any of these things, right? Where it's not like we're doing randomized controlled trials of let's take these right. patients from MIS-C and these patients. We, 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 we right. tried three things that work in concert mm. and they work quite well and they work for most kids. And so we haven't been deviating from them. And I think it would be a bit of a, a lift to do it when, when everybody's happy with the results of what we've been doing. Yeah. I mean, you guys have much small, you know, we don't know a lot of these things for adults where we have like a hundred times the end. So yeah, it, it is, you're in a tough spot. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a quick, uh, some minor question. So the definition of CDC is pretty broad, like kids, anybody under the age of 21, right? And even school age is pretty broad. So my question to you is in the limited samples that you've seen, is there any age that is more predisposed than the other? Yeah, so the, if you, even if you go to the CDC webpage um, that's, that's tracking this, there's a, there's a bell curve and it centers around nine. Uh, so nine is the, is the most common age. Uh, you know, I think six to 12 is, would, would capture the majority of children, but we certainly see younger and we've certainly seen older. Wow, okay. Uh, definitely the school age, yes. <laughs> All right, yeah. Laura? Well, yeah, no, Laura, Laura, that was, thank you so much for your time. And, yeah. and this is super timely. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Bye-bye. Yeah. So you take care and um, John, can you bring up the um, slide for next week, please? Yes, so we've um, got uh, Victoria Mail from uh, Imperial College uh, London next week. Um, will be super exciting. So uh, same time, same place. See you next week. All right, stay safe everyone, bye.